Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today, helping to create a better and safer tomorrow for all of us. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined uh, by Mr. John Sherman, who is the Chief Information Officer at the United States Department of Defense, uh, a role he was sworn into uh, back in December of 2021, uh, where he became the principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense for Information Management, Technology, and Assurance, uh, as well as non-intelligent space systems, critical satellite communications, navigation, timing programs, as well as spectrum uh, and telecommunication matters. Uh, previously, in addition to serving as both um, acting CIO and principal deputy, uh, before joining the department, Mr. Sherman uh, served uh, in the intelligence community as CIO. Um, and in that position, he was involved in driving and coordinating uh, various areas of IT modernization across the U.S. intelligence uh, community 17 agencies. Uh, he led advancements uh, to their cloud computing, cybersecurity, interoperability capabilities. Uh, and prior to his tour as intelligence uh, community CIO, served as the deputy director of the CIA's open source enterprise, where he helped transform that area, leveraging new technologies, interagency partnerships, ultimately growing their mission. Previous to that, served several years as a senior executive uh, at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, uh, leading their organization, analysis, collection, homeland security, various areas of organizational strategy and international affairs. He began his career uh, as an imagery an analyst. Uh, Mr. Sherman is a, a distinguished military graduate of Texas A&M, uh, where he commanded uh, the Corps of Cadets. He received a Bachelor of Arts degree in history, went on to get his master's in public administration from the University of Houston, and uh, following graduation from Texas A&M, he also served as an air defense officer in the 24th Infantry Division. Uh, he's a graduate of the DOD Capstone course, uh, the leading the uh, intelligence community course and the CIA director seminar. And he has had numerous awards over the years, including distinguished and meritorious presidential rank, uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency Director Award, the CIA Intelligence Medal of Merit, uh, including many others. We're honored to have him with us today. Uh, Mr. John Sherman, uh, welcome to our show. Thank you, Ira. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with you today. So thank you for having me. Yeah, it, it, it's really an honor. I, I, I very much appreciate your time and obviously your long service to our country. You know, it was very interesting because, you know, I, I took some time uh, ahead of this show sort of looking through past interviews you've done as well as uh, a little bit about, you know, your nomination and some of the opening statements you gave to the uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee back in October of 2021. And in that uh, opening statement, aside from sort of mentioning your, your, your wife and kids, you talked a little bit about your parents, um, a little bit about how uh, lessons from a very early age in three areas, hard work, respect for others, and ultimately citizenship really guided sort of your mission from, from the very early days to what you're doing now. Talk a little bit about those early days, if you would. Uh, talk about your parents and a little bit of how this whole journey got started. Thank you. So both my parents are not with us anymore, but they're in my heart always. My father, Lynn Bradley Sherman, he was six foot four very large man, and he couldn't stand his first name of Lynn, L-Y-N-N. -N. I'll just go on record with that. Uh, but And my mother, Carol Gale, uh, she was a, a slight in stature, but strong in personality. And I'll tell you about both. Uh, my father was a lifelong steel salesman, and especially plate steel. And he was at companies in Texas, but traveled all over the country to Chicago and California and Pittsburgh, 
selling this very special type of steel, uh, high density alloy. And he had also served a little bit of time in the Air Force Reserve back in the 60s. And he was a consummate reader of news, history, politics, business, and taught me the, the imperative to be aware of what's going on in our nation, to be involved, to vote, to learn about who came before us and what mistakes were made and how can we do better. Be involved, be a good citizen, uh, protect our nation, lean in wherever we can and take things conscientiously, which is what he did in his career. Now, my mother, uh, she worked as what's, and they had divorced when I was young. Uh, she worked as a, what's called a landman in the oil. It's a gender neutral term, but it's someone who handles mineral rights for oil exploration. You know, lots of picture stacks of file on her, her, her desk. And she smoked probably many packs of cigarettes a day, but working many long hours uh, in South Texas on that. But what she taught me there was respect. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Respect your elders. Stand up straight, shoulders back. You're representing yourself always and always proceed with honor. And those combination, that, that combination of, of background and although they were, like I said, different people who ended up separating, but it provided a good grounding for me to, to stand up straight, to lean in, to always be respectful. And one other thing I'll note, too, is I think they never actually exactly said this, but as I watch them as they treated other people with humility and kindness, I've often said my favorite song, one of my favorite songs is Tim McGraw's 2016 song, uh, Humble and Kind. Mm. And if you listen to the lyrics of there or in that song, that really is how I try to approach life. Treat others with respect. Help people coming up behind you. Hold the door. Uh, just not be aggressive and always assume noble intent. And that's if you want to know who I am and how I operate. I think that Tim McGraw song, based on what my parents taught me, is is who I am now as a leader and an executive. Outstanding. Really outstanding. So, you know, John, suffice it to say that this Department of Defense Chief information officer role is not like any other CIO role out there uh, because of the scope of these responsibilities, uh, the very distributed nature of what you're involved in. Um, as a little background, as I mentioned in the intro, you had to be nominated by the President of the United States, Joe Biden, uh, confirmed by the Senate, formally sworn in. And just a, you know, a little bit, your roles and responsibilities in addition to uh, the IT roles of our military service branches, so Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Space Force, and National Guard, uh, also include our various national intelligence agencies under the Department of Defense, so uh, DIA, NSA, National Geospatial, and Reconnaissance Offices, and all the support function agencies, so the DARPAs, the DITRAs of the, uh, of the system, and as you mentioned, and, and I was watching in a, in a recent presentation, literally thousands of other companies that work with our Defense Department to get things done. Um, to start off, I would love, obviously, you're sitting there at the Pentagon. Um, walk us through, if you would, just a typical day in the life of John Sherman, DOD CIO. I mean, just to give us a little feel, if you would, for something that none of us could experience. Let's put it that way. So I'll add to the list, too, the combatant commands, which are globally and functionally aligned that 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 do the war fighting or peacekeeping exactly. and everything else that needs to get done. So a typical day, it can be very strategic. And that's one thing I never take my eye off the ball. What are the big goals? So some of the things we're working right now are the upcoming award for the Joint Warfighting Cloud Capability, which has a $9 billion contract ceiling multi potential multi cloud multi vendor something we've never done at this level of enterprise implementation we're going to make that announcement early in december so i've been in a lot of meetings about that we're rolling out a new what we call zero trust strategy which is a type of cybersecurity that assumes the adversaries on the network and you have to do a lot of steps to prevent the adversary from moving laterally across your network where you where you verify identities and you have different technologies and approaches and processes to ensure a new way of securing our vast enterprise and our weapon systems. I do a lot with what we call command control communications. I was just in a meeting about this in terms of making sure our, our weapons platforms, our service members have the very best technologies as we look now towards 
uh, being ready to have to combat a state adversary of so-called on by the president, whether it's in the Far East or Europe or elsewhere, to be able to move into very contested areas, whereas over the last 20 years, fighting violent extremists and terrorists, which represented their own distinct kind of threat, now we have to be ready to fly into electromagnetic spectrum spaces that are highly contested, things we haven't had to do potentially since the Vietnam War and perhaps Desert Storm and elsewhere. So looking at these strategic issues, but doing it with tactical implementation where needed, talking to the military services and the program offices about why a certain thing is not getting fixed that's along the critical path to get us to success for a combatant command's operational needs. Working with a key stakeholder, such as the Defense Information System Agency, who works for me and with me, General Bob Skinner there, on the cloud contract, bird dogging that very closely. And then working on the cybersecurity pieces, making sure that we've got this strategy ready to go. We've looked at funding. We've got the, I oversee what's called the, the Capability Planning Guidance, or CPG, which provides guidance to the entire enterprise, our roughly $54 billion IT enterprise, over where we need to be making investments. Where do we need to throttle up? Where do we need to throttle back? And that's my typical day here is looking at very strategic things, but also without getting into the weeds, but making sure I lean in and provide the support to the deputy CIOs, the military CIOs, and what are called the, the sixes, which are the military officers in a staff code known as the, it goes from one up to about nine, but the sixes are handling information technology and command and control, making sure that I am providing them what they need, clearing the barriers out of the way, but never taking our eye off the strategic so what to make sure if we have to conduct operations tonight, we're as ready as we can be and our women and men are as protected as they can be with the best technology. And, and, and you know, continuing along those lines, so, you know, a, as you have um, advanced uh, over your career and sort of um, escalated in these roles, so thinking about uh, National Geospatial, uh, where you had tens of thousands of uh, people you had to think about in the IT system to the intelligence community, hundreds of thousands, and now Defense Department upwards of four million, um, and everything from as uh, you know from the satellites to the missile systems to the pharmacies, computer system at Fort Bragg, <laughs> and everything in between. Um, Talk a little bit about obviously there's a lot of challenges here, but talk a little bit as you've sort of gone up that escalator of, of, of responsibility and and the responsibility of your responsibility has in, in basically exponentially increased. Some of the challenges that you've run into along the way, some of the things that maybe surprised you uh, that that didn't exist, things that, you know, were pleasantly surprising. Talk a little bit about that, if you would. So what I've learned along the way, it really is about teamwork, particularly as you get higher up in larger and larger enterprises. And so here at the Department of Defense, I can sit in the CIO office and we we work these hard things. I, I implement guidance. I have authorities on budget and other things. But at the end of the day, I'm only successful if the what we call military department CIOs at the Department of the Air Force, Department of Army, Department of Navy, uh, the the six, as I mentioned, those military mm -hmm. officers on the joint staff and the combatant commands, the 28 defense agencies and field activities that are around. You mentioned the intelligence ones, but there's many others, defense logistics, missile defense agency, defense threat reduction agency, all over the world and here in the nation. I've got to bring them along. And so my job is a lot I need to be conversant on technical. It's a lot less getting into the technical weeds, but it really is about leadership and bringing a coalition along, empowering them, but also having boundaries where needed, where some things are non-negotiable on cybersecurity and certain command and control mechanisms we have to have in place, but also encouraging innovation. And knowing we up in the E-ring where I sit may not be the font of all knowledge on everything. The Navy, for example, may come up with something highly creative. We need to get up on the radar of everybody else. But to your point about surprises I've learned along the way, uh, it, the complexity of the problems can be surprising and how many people's hands are on the steering wheel and trying to work through with folks who have noble intent, but getting through the authorization on issues, teeing up big ideas, working through uh, properly with our congressional overseers and the White House and others into align big things and to get them in for a landing. 
in a way that is 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 proper and right for the country and it's a, all the right things we've done and so i'll give you an example in the intelligence community i led the reformulation of the cloud strategy there which led to what was called the commercial cloud enterprise or c2e which is the intelligence community's version of a multi-cloud multi-vendor strategy at different classification levels so that was a big deal. We set the parameters for that, worked with the different stakeholders at CIA and NSA and all the other places, but it took a lot of sweat equity in that and a lot of handholding and working with very smart individuals to make sure we got that into a landing place. And now as you move up here to DOD, working some of these very big, potentially contentious issues like the joint warfighting cloud capability. We've never done this before. We tried a few years ago with what was called the Jedi cloud contract, okay. which uh, kind of went asunder in litigation. And also it just wasn't what we needed anymore. And so I recommended cancellation of that, of that up to Secretary Austin. A lot of eyes on that issue. And I've said it once, I'll say it again. I think it was the right idea for the right time, but that required... Uh, the right leaning in and doing the right thing to recommend we cancel that and pivot to a multi-cloud way ahead. And I had to do something like that in the intelligence community, canceling something called the desktop enterprise, which in short was as you went to the different agencies around town, you should be able to sit down at a desktop and log in and get your desktop up right there. Sounds simple, right? Not simple at all. We had <laughs> sunk a lot of money in that. And it just wasn't going to work. And one of the hardest things I had to do initially in my IC job was recommending to my leaders that we got to pull the plug on this. We've culminated to a point and it's just not worth the taxpayer money and the effort to continue this. And that's starting things are cool, but also it takes moral courage, I think, in working with stakeholders to say, this is not going to get us where we need to. And the kind of old sunk cost argument, this is where my history piece comes in, having you know read about wars and Southeast Asia and everything, where just because we've invested so much, there's a time when you have to say, we've invested enough, this isn't going to pan out, time to pivot somewhere else. So those are some of the things I would add on that. Excellent. Excellent. And so you mentioned um, you know, a couple of times the the JWCC, the Joint Warfighter Cloud Capability, the sort of the successor to the Jedi. But that itself, my understanding, it sits within something else. And I, I would like to, if you could just say a few words sure. uh, about JADC2, the yep. Joint All Domain Command, Command and Control, which is in basic, well, integrating is everything into one single network that doesn't exist today. Say a few words about that one, if you sure. will. Sure. I know this can sound wonky, even to people maybe in defense circles, but particularly those who are maybe outside of defense and intelligence. Here, I talked about this earlier this week, and I will just echo what I said then. We have to succeed as a multi-service, multifunctional organization uh, uh, operating across all the domains, land, air, sea, space, cyberspace, and with coalition allies that are critical for us to do what we need to do around the world. And to be able to operate and do this, we have to move with absolute agility and understanding and insight in a way, and I compare it, and this may not be the perfect metaphor, but watching whatever your sport of choice is, an amazing NBA team or NFL team, and I'm not talking the cream of the crop, the very best. I won't say any teams, so I don't offend anybody, but picture in your mind, you know, some of the greats throughout history, you know, as they Michael Jordan at the Bulls in the mid-90s yeah. or whatever, operating with such uh, urgency, such insight, almost a sixth sense of being able to get data back and forth and move quicker and with greater insight than an adversary can. So what I talk about with this, what JADC2 really is, is enabling a commander or set of commanders to have the data they need immediately when they need it to be able to make decisions and stay ahead of what's going on and then allow the folks down at the shooter end um, whether it be a U.S. Marine high Mars battery firing rockets, communicating perhaps with an Australian frigate who's passing data in real time, with maybe a Japanese self-defense force F-35 who has acquired a target, is passing it to the high Mars. And this has to happen at great speed, with great cybersecurity, with what we call transport, being able to move the data around with data standards where it doesn't show up in on the the high mar commander on her her uh, laptop in some garbled fashion it's got to be crystal clear and be able to fire before an adversary can make sense of what's going on that's jad c2 i know joint all domain and command and control is is maybe a little bit of a tough term but that's what i see it as so for yep. me as a cio I've got my marching orders, and JWCC is a critical part of that, to have cloud capabilities all the way from here at the Pentagon in the United States out to what we call the tactical edge, 
Think of an island in the Western Pacific or think of somewhere in Eastern Europe or anywhere else where you have cloud computing capability that may be connected to the network for a time or disconnected with very modern transport, be it SATCOM or terrestrial, fiber, you name it, that's very secure using zero trust to be able to provide. And then with data standards, working with our chief digital and AI officer and the military services and our allies and others to provide that that lethal agility, that survivable agility that we have to have to win. And that's what gets me out of bed. So I'm I'm at the foundational level. We're going to get JWCC right, zero trust, a lot of these command control issues. But then the military services and the combatant commands will take this to the next level and exercise this, run the plays. And that's what JADC2 is to me and why JWCC matters so much. Awesome. Awesome. And then just to, uh, to loop back around one more time before we get into some of the innovation topics to zero trust, because when I when I was first reading about that, I was thinking zero trust. Uh, it would seem like we want an infinite amount of trust in, in, for cyber defense. But then as you explain it, uh, three things again, assume the adversary is already in the system, continually validate the folks that are in the system. And then, as you put it, trust no, trust no one or nothing along until you know, you're really damn sure. Talk about zero trust just for a couple of minutes, if you would. So here's what I would say on that. And you'll, tr- you're, if you really read about this, you'll hear terms like least privilege access, okay. which means kind of lowest denominator. I watch Game of Thrones a bit. I didn't get oh, through yeah. the whole House of Dragons just yet. Maybe. The picture of Castle, one of these reinforced cities, cybersecurity in the past was at the perimeter. And so if the invaders got, you know, through the, through the door on the or the big wooden doors on the gates to the city or or tunneled under or we've always seen this in different movies or get through the drainage ditch or whatever they're in the city they can pour in there and start doing all sorts of nefarious activities and moving laterally you know moving from one house to the next moving from one strong point to the next and again whether whatever movie you want to think of kingdom of heaven troy we've all seen this before um And that's what zero trust is, is one, you can't just defend at the perimeter. You still have to do that. You don't want to take down your walls. You still need, but now taking it to a technology sort of moving from my medieval castle example, you need to be able to know what's, what should be connected to the network. Um, Whether it's a person or what we call a non-person entity, verifying it every step of the way using what we call identity credential access management, who that is, what that is, not trusting anything, even a software update that just kind of sails through the door and is now loose in your enterprise and can run laterally. Some of this sounds kind of like, well, we should have been doing this all along, but it's tricky. It's difficult. And I'll tell you the other flip side of this, because I've gotten a finger in the chest from a number of operational entities, and uh, whether it's Army surgeons at the War College or submariners that, uh, not submariners, I've been corrected by them, submariners out doing undersea activities. We can't make this where it's glitchy, that if they need the back to JADC2, the data they need, the access they need. So we've got to have all the underpinnings of this with the credential access management, with the standards with what we call the seven pillars of zero trust, which I've just talked about some of them, to make this seamless but secure. And then so if the Chinese or Russians or North Korean or Iranians or a non-state actor are trying to get on our network, they they can maybe get in, but they can't move anywhere. They can't go infect the rest of the network. They can't corrupt data. They can't exfiltrate data. Um, one other metaphor is kind of like a, a a burglar breaking into your house Maybe they'll get over the fence into your yard. Maybe they'll get into your laundry room, but they're not going anywhere else. And they can't even maybe get out of the laundry room. They're not getting to your desk room upstairs. They're not getting to your bedroom or wherever else you don't want them, where you may have important papers or something. They're stuck. And they can't, that lateral access is gone. And then we can eradicate them out of there. That's zero trust in a nutshell. So when we publish a zero trust strategy, It's going to have what we call basic level of zero trust and then more advanced for even our more sensitive networks. And it's going to have a lot of activities you're going to see we have to do. So and one last thing I'll say on zero trust is almost become a catchphrase uh, that that you hear on the commercials and everything. You can't buy zero trust. There's not one thing you just buy and go, we're done. This is a journey to get done. So we put down a marker that we're going to have us. The bulk of our our what we call our unclassified and secret networks at zero trust by 2027. Now that sounds like a long time, and some would argue it's not quick enough. But it's taken certain vendors whose name you would know over 10 to 12 years to get there. So we are moving with alacrity, and that's zero trust. Awesome, awesome. Um, 
John, moving to um, your you had a, you were at the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, in front of the subcommittee on personnel on the cyber workforce, and here you were you know you were talking about obviously we're, we're at the bleeding edge of these technologies. We need to recruit people, we need to retain them, and <clears throat> obviously there's lots of other places they could go, uh, but we don't want them to go to wherever Facebook. Well, they're not going to go Facebook <laughs> or Twitter, but elsewhere. Um, we need them here. We need lucrative incentives, and we need that next generation to be educated in these highly advanced skills to keep the you know to keep the zero trust and, and, and these other systems operating at, 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 at uh, pristine functionality. Um, talk a little bit about the cyber talent pipeline, how we optimize for it, and then obviously how. Potentially, we go about and sending that next generation, you know, my kids that are <laughs> coming along to to get involved in these areas as opposed to whatever the law. So that was that was kind of a watershed testimony for me. Uh, it was in April of 2021 to Senator Gillibrand's subcommittee on, as you note, on personnel on the Armed yep. Services Committee. And it caused me to really dive deep with some amazing people we have on our team to really assess where we at in the movie on this, where should where should we be going and and what is our way ahead? And the, probably the biggest thing that came out of that was I recognized we didn't have a cyber workforce or digital workforce strategy. Um, we have some different strategies on digital modernization overall, but we have never published a cyber workforce strategy. Hmm. And we're going to here within about the next month or so. It's in some final stages of coordination and going through all the wickets with that. But a few points I'll bring up on this. It really is about the people. I can talk about cloud and zero trust and data and all that, but I want the most qualified women and men we can possibly get in here. And I want a workforce that looks like America. I've said often, this really is our space race of our generation, without any disrespect to those in the commercial or government space industry. But where we need that level of innovation with a highly diverse workforce and thinking differently about how we bring folks in and think differently about what their wants and needs will be. 30-year careers in the government are probably not a top priority for many of the folks we're bringing in. They want to come serve, maybe for a few years, for patriotic reasons, uh, standing up to maybe over Russian disinformation or Chinese malfeasance in the Western Pacific or counterterrorism, you name it. But eventually, they may, after a few years, may want to go out to industry, maybe make a little more money, uh, re-broaden uh, their experiences. And then maybe come back in a number of years at a higher, more senior level. And we've got to figure out how to do that. There's a lot of tools in our toolkit we already have that I think Senator Gillibrand and others would say that we need to even exercise more. Areas like what we call cyber accepted service, which is an authority we have to expedite hiring for certain skill sets, to be able to pay them a little bit more, to be able to get in front of this a bit. We also have what we call, and this sounds a little wonky, but the Defense Cyber Workforce Framework, which is a framework of all the different skill sets to be able to kind of allow us as a dashboard to look across like, whoa, we're getting low on this type of coder, or we need more AI specialists, where we can then apply certain types of authorities we have, like local pay incentive for people to be able to come in. These are all tools Congress has given to us that we need to make sure we're using. Because if I was sitting on the other side, I'd say, hey, DOD, we've given you quite a bit of authority and latitude. You better use it. And I, that was one of the things you mentioned back in April of last year and that we've been trying to put into place here. And then also just thinking differently, a new kind of heuristic about how we're going to think about where and how we're going to recruit. Do people really need four-year degrees to do some of this? Can we look mm -hmm. at folks who have come out of community college or two-year degrees? Can we look at folks who have come out of the military? It's about experience and skill and not about degrees. And then how do we write that into contracts for our industry partners? And that will widen the aperture. Let's not recruit in the same place over and over again. Let's think differently about the settings and locations where we recruit. This is what we're going to have to do. And I've said this once, and I'll say it many times. Our, our diverse way of thinking and coming at problems is our strength. This is what scares the devil out of our, our potential adversaries. If I can add real quick on this, my son, sure. who's a deputy DA out in Denver, he sometimes sends me little news clips and everything. And he sent me this video of a video is a little cheesy, but it was the maintainers of the army parachute teams aircraft. And it was the most diverse group you've ever seen. Uh, African-American female crew chief, uh, 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 Indian American sick, 
uh, NCO, and uh, it was uh, folks of Hispanic uh, heritage, and it was a slice of America. Now, they were doing some kind of TikTok-ish kind of video. <laughs> but I looked at that and said, that's why we're going to win if this ever comes up. And we have to have that same spirit on the cyber side. And we do in many areas, but we got to keep up the press on this and not just saying you must have a four-year degree from these colleges and institutions for us to be able to talk to you. And you must have worked cyber for this amount of time because we're going to we're going to limit the talent pool that we need to bring in. And so that's a little bit about what we're trying to do on the cyber and digital talent side of the house. Outstanding. Outstanding. Um. John, looking forward now, sort of to uh, to the frontier. I know what you know. In addition to um, the CIO role, uh, you were also, until recently, uh, serving a second role as sort of the acting head of uh, the chief digital and artificial intelligence officer uh, at the Department of Defense. And you know, we have on this show had the honor of profiling many of the uh, the top AI minds uh, from folks like uh, Dr. Jane Pinellas at the Jake, Hassan Teta. Um, we had uh, Brian Drake on from DIA who told us all about uh, Operation Sable Spear and uh, trying to help with the opioid uh, crisis and, and monitoring you know, fentanyl coming out of China and all that. Um, really a fascinating area. So I'd like to really divide our talk about sort of innovation or innovative technologies into really two bad Baskets. Uh, first, artificial intelligence, and then we'll get into everything else. But talk a little bit of AI about you know y- y- the role you were in prior, or this additional role, and, and a little bit of where you see us going with AI. Obviously, it's so critical across all these functions and, and, and crunching the data and coming up with new insights. Talk a little about AI, if you would. So I got to give a shout out to start with to Dr. Craig Martell, who is the CDAO now. He was the head of machine learning at Lyft. He had worked at LinkedIn and some other places, but he is certainly super talented at this. And I had the privilege to hear him speak last week. Uh, We have what we call the Five Eyes CIO Forum. The Canadians hosted in Victoria, British Columbia. And we had Craig come up and talk with our allies and, and some others about what he's learned in industry and what we need to get after here at DOD. So hold that thought. My role standing this up was basically bringing the organizations together, the Joint AI Center, the Jake, as you noted, Defense Digital Service Services, the Chief Data Officer Organization, and what we call the Advana team, which is our storehouse and analytical tool for all of our different data that we surface up for uh, analytics to be able to show how we're performing. So this was a little bit of storming, norming, forming, bringing new team members together, standing up a new organization, getting the right structure around it. And then with our CIO organization, kind of doing a left seat, right seat as they got their administrative processes stood up, their their staffing, their funding. So helping with that and then bringing in somebody of, of Craig Martell's bona fides. And then you mentioned Jane Pinellas, Dr. Mm-hmm. Jane Pinellas, a world-renowned AI specialist and many others there, bringing them together. And now what we do is we have a very complementary relationship where the capabilities I talked about, cloud, et cetera, will enable what Craig is going to do. So back to what Craig talked about up in British Columbia, he will argue, and rightfully, we talk a lot about AI, but at the end of the day, it's really about data. And how are we going to get our data organized? How are we going to train our algorithm, algorithms on that data and be able to do the hard pick and shovel work to make sure that we have standardization properly, not try to put all the data in separate repositories, but have a data integration layer that the algorithms can run against. There's a lot of lessons learned he brings from industry of, of issues that have not worked, things that have worked, and, and getting after areas like bias in AI that we don't want to have. And I don't just mean the bias you read about um, right. against uh, uh, ethnic origin or appearance, but bias, it can affect you know what target you're going to look at. Bias is going to affect how an aircraft could fly or something like that. But it really, he talks a lot about, and I, I think this is really cool, we got to get our data pieces right, which we've made great strides with our CDO organization that's now part of the, the CDAO. But the AI piece, will we're going to develop that, and not as a bunch of one-offs either, but this has got to be an enterprise set of capabilities, and really the data integration layer is what's going to make AI work at scale. And I'm so pleased to have Craig and his team on, because again, he is the pro on this, and uh, being able to provide him the capabilities. JWCC is another area. I mentioned JADC2. Yep. JWCC, those 
that potential multi-cloud, multi-vendor, all three security classifications to include up to special access program, he's going to need that to be able to work all across the different combatant commands and these big projects that are going to rely on AI. And, and, and hopping from the AI bucket now into the everything else bucket and in here I'll put um, things like edge computing in austere environments. Um, we got this really cool task force 59 working on these uh, unmanned surface uh, vehicles for the Navy. Um, I don't know where quantum fits into any of this, but um, John, what else gets you excited? I mean, you mentioned a lot of sort of the day-to-day -day activities to get you excited, but future looking, looking at five, 10 years, what are the, the really cool, you know, things you thought about as a kid, comic book wise that, you know, hey, we, we got to develop these things too. Well, I don't know if I thought about this as a kid, but one, well, what I did think about as a kid, I've always been fascinated with space, yeah. uh, NASA during the 60s, the heyday and all that. So I'll tell you one area, and I did a lot on overhead reconnaissance earlier in my career, yeah. the commercial satellite communications or a term you'll hear, PLEO, proliferated low earth orbits, kind of a wonky term. And there's some companies we all recognize that have been in the news a lot, but the, the proliferation of low earth orbit satellites that provide satellite communication and internet access all across the world in low earth orbit, meaning about 200 miles, maybe a little higher, to be able to provide uh, resilient communication because our potential adversaries have shown the capability to be able to shoot down large satellites. They shot down their own satellites and created debris fields in space. But if you have thousands of these small satellites that are coming over at all different inclinations and different times that we can have a ship at sea communicate with, at pretty decent bandwidth and be able to, to uh, leverage different orbits and so on, that's a big deal. That to me gets me excited. And you tie that in with terrestrial communications, fiber optic, you'll hear terms like mesh networks. This is exciting. This greatly complicates an adversary's ability to cut us off from a communication link. That's something that, that I'm excited about. You're seeing it used in Ukraine and elsewhere, and we've got to stay at the forward edge of this. And I'll tell you, it's not just about, oh, where are the satellites and kind of the big high visibility stuff, but things like receivers, things like how you're going to mount these on a, a, a joint land vehicle, JLTV, or maybe a ship, or a marine unit that's out forward or something. There's there's a lot of not only contractual pieces, but technical pieces. That gets me excited. We talk about command and control. We Again, if we have to fight a state adversary, we're going to have to deal with a highly, what we call a highly contested and congested environment in the electronic warfare spectrum where they, they're trying to jam us and spoof us, and they're going to try to interrupt our global positioning system. They're going to try to cut off our ability to maneuver and fire ordnance. There's a lot we have to do in this space to really double down and make sure when we're sending aircraft to a target or missiles or ships, that the adversary cannot cut us off, cannot put us back in the 1950s with something where we're having to navigate with compasses or dead reckoning. <laughs> and not that our service members cannot bravely do that and, and drop iron bombs and so on, but not on my watch. Are they going to have to do what they had to do in 1966 or wherever when we were last having to do this? And, and finally, you mentioned edge compute. This is an area we're pushing our industry partners on to be able to have cloud-like capabilities right out at an island in the Pacific or yeah. on a distant battlefield, perhaps in Eastern Europe or somewhere or, or Sub-Sahara Africa, to be able to have cloud in a box. And a number of the vendors have things, and I won't use the vendor names or their, their uh, branding for these capabilities, and to be able to have points of presence where you can get back on fiber to be able to reconnect back to wherever you need to, but also do the computing out forward, which is critical for, to and as we leverage AI capabilities in the forward area, you don't want to have to backhaul all the data and compute. So things like that. And then finally, uh, as we look at 5G and next G spectrum related issues, not only here for communication in the United States, but tactical applications of that, thinking about how we're going to leverage that. We have AI, or excuse me, 5G pilots underway for things like smart warehousing and healthcare and maintenance. There's a lot we need to do and continue to do, and I'll just close on this point on this question, is in concert with our uh, uh, colleagues at the Commerce Department and elsewhere, is to share spectrum, not vacate, but share in a way that we can do what we need to do here in the United States for training and operations and also allow U.S. industry to be able to use that spectrum, but in a way that's not a zero-sum game where we have to vacate completely. 
where they then would buy it through an auction where then we're not able to train our service members in Arizona or Texas or California or whatever. But in a way, we can walk and chew gum on this mm -hmm. where we use it part of the time. We can use a technology that exists and then allow our U.S. telecom industry to continue to be a world leader. That's that's something I focus heavily on. Excellent. Excellent. John, you mentioned uh, you know a couple times, obviously the importance of of these major collaborations with uh, sort of the the leaders in industry, the Microsofts and and the Amazons and so forth of the world. But you know at the same time, and it and it's been very refreshing as I've talked to uh, some of these different members of DoD, um, sort of the um, the extent to which we're beginning to see our, our Department of Defense operate in with a very sort of venture capital mindset, looking at the startup innovators, the smaller innovators that are out there, uh, talking to groups like uh, AFWorks, the Air Force, SoftWorks, and Special Forces, uh, in Intel, but that's, you know, uh, intelligence community related, but nonetheless, looking at uh, sort of the potential of both sort of university startups, the, the small startup innovators, talk a little bit about this role, because I think this is so very important because, uh, you know, whether it's any industry, it's IT, biotech, uh, anything out there, that's where a lot of the real creativity stems from. And, and I just love to get your perspective on sort of this venture capital model and the importance of it in, in sort of the way uh, you think at, at, at DOD and in the CIO role, especially looking at the IT functions. This is really our national advantage here. I know, obviously, internationally, there's a lot of technology work uh, with our potential competitors. There is. But when you look at technology innovation in the United States and with a number of our key allies, this is something that we have tapped into since World War II and before, all the way through the Cold War, the space race, and up until now. And we've learned a lot of lessons, and we still haven't perfected this yet by any stretch. And meeting with venture capitalists, small startups, and others, you mentioned InQtel, which I work with in the IC. For example, in DOD, we have the Defense Innovation Unit yep. that works on these areas. And then... Really here in the Pentagon, our leads on this are research and engineering under Ms. Heidi Shu, who's undersecretary yep. for that, and undersecretary for acquisition sustainment under uh, Dr. Bill LaPlante. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have a good bit of interaction and skin in the game on this, but in terms of thinking about what we call our innovation ecosystem, and we've yep. been working closely with them, looking at all the way from there's an ideation of a potential new capability that's out in the commercial sector or a defense need. You mentioned some of the AF works and other things all the way through that that dreaded, quote, valley of death that yeah. sometimes is hard to get stuff over. And sometimes things need to get cold in the valley of death. You don't want everything coming over because it just sure. can't scale. It's not practical. It's not mature. It's not at the technical readiness level. But those things you do, you don't want to lose there because the VC is not able to keep up you know, whatever series of funding they're on, the company's not going to be able to have the momentum to get across and all the way through to implementation of that through their life cycle. So what we're doing under Deputy Secretary Hicks's direction, working with Dr. Laplante and Ms. Hsu, we in CIO, working with Dr. Martell and, and CDAO, are looking at all the kind of stop sticks, my word, that get you along the way. And I've actually am working the security and cybersecurity portfolio piece with Honorable Ron Moultrie, who's right up the hall, the Undersecretary for Intelligence and Security, on things like cyber maturity model certification, which is where you have to get certified, this is going into rulemaking right now, if you're handling controlled unclassified information on your contract, things like accrediting uh, compartmented intelligence uh, rooms and facilities and how long that takes, how long it takes to accredit software, all these things, listening to the companies to say, look, you're making it too hard for us, particularly small and medium businesses and also the large big primes, but those startups, those innovators to not make this such an obstacle course where they just kind of run out of gas and say, look, we had a thing that was going to help you on this mission set but we just ran out of ran out of gas here along the way or ran out of funding. So I'll be honest with you, we have not solved this. And I think a lot of your listeners and others would argue we still have a ways to go. But I want them to know we get it. We're working it. And we specifically want to be mindful of those. So there are roughly, I've heard differing numbers, but up to 300,000 companies in the U.S. defense industrial base. Think about that, 300,000. Everything from a five-person company to those that employ hundreds of thousands. And we need to be able to draw on that innovation from all of them to provide that qualitative edge that our warfighters are going to need. So this a little bit, so you'll hear innovation ecosystem, and that's what we're working on with that. 
Awesome. Really great. Um, John, one thing before before we wrap up, I, I um, coming back to sort of your and where we started off with with your nomination uh, in 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 front of the the Senate Armed Service Committee, and uh, you, you mentioned your son before, but it, in the uh, the nomination, you also you know gave a shout out to your to your wife Liz, and and when I googled her, um, you know a really cool article came up from the uh, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. You know she had a pr very amazing career there. Um, my parents worked together for uh, for thirty years in the pharmaceutical industry. They loved each other very much, but they come home unfortunately bring business home, and they would fight terribly um i'm sure you don't talk about intelligence or defense or you know <laughs> imagery analysis uh, in, in your spare time but um say a few words about about liz if you would and just sure. uh yeah. and also briefly i want to give a shout out to my daughter savannah That's savannah exciting. doyle married to a navy officer who works awesome. at nsa and savannah is a, a finishing her master's for social work and so she's serving her community as well up near Baltimore there. So I'm very proud of her. Excellent. I'm super proud of my wonderful wife of nearly 31 years, Liz. Um, so yeah, she's worked at NGA uh, for since 1999. Before that, she was a newspaper reporter. And I'll tell you, you're right. Obviously, we're not going to talk about classified stuff at home, but the working in national security together is a number of couples do here in DOD and the intelligence community. I'll give you an example. 9-11 affected all of us. Yep. Um, my kids in preschool at the time, the teacher had to take them home because I couldn't get out of the White House where I was working as a duty officer. And my wife was over at the Washington Navy Yard where they wouldn't, <laughs> uh, she wasn't able to get out. After 9-11, our workload had already been busy, uh, but was all out, all consuming. Uh, my wife uh, has deployed multiple times. She's been on extended temporary deployment, uh, TDYs, to Africa, uh, to Afghanistan, Colombia. Um, I'll tell you one thing I'm so proud of her. She has been a technical innovator. And you might remember back in the early 2000s, there were several U.S. hostages being kept in Colombia by the sure. FARC. Their aircraft yep. had been shot down. My wife, I can't go into the details, but used a very innovative technique to help our national security apparatus What uh, with what uh, became the rescue operation. And she got a thank you note from one of the hostages there that she go. still cherishes today <laughs> that uh, she keeps. Uh, and, and, and I forget which hostage it was, but taking time to write her letter saying, I understand you played a key role in this. She's been under fire in Iraq. She has done all this while, as I want to give her major credit here, as we've worked together raising two amazing kids. Um, and it is, it, and I know a lot of couples are doing this as well. It, it's tough. And the other thing I want to give her a shout out on is I know there were many late hours as we were sitting in traffic, as we were working shift work or what have you. And the cool thing about it, my son and daughter would say they wouldn't have had it any other way. They are so <laughs> proud of her. Um, and because it's tough for parents in national security, either parent, and uh, but to be able to have your kids say we wouldn't have had it any other way, I think is a testament to her leadership and her uh, sacrifice and what she's done for this nation. I'm so proud of her. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I appreciate you sharing that story. And I just, I just, I wanted to come full circle with that because I think, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, it comes back to family, uh, their families behind everybody and, and, and the integrated story, I think is, uh, is really important. Um, really, really impressive work, John. I, I just, you know, I, I continue to, to follow you as you, uh, continue to pursue these amazing programs at the DOD uh, to, to advance things, advance technology, keep us safe. Uh, what Before I let you go, one, anything else coming up for 2022 as we enter 2023 that we should know about outside of all of these things you've touched on? Please take the floor on the way out. I think we talked about a lot of the major things with okay. cloud, cybersecurity, command and control. But maybe I want to end with the, one of the most important things is the women and men who are out in the force yep. that are out there at whatever name your installation. They're aboard a, a Navy vessel. They're in an Air Force base, a Space Force base, Marine Corps base, Army. I can go down the whole list here uh, on a Coast Guard cutter, National Guard out responding to wildfires or whatever they're doing. That's what gets me up every single day here is to make sure – they have what they need. And I recognize that every day we need to keep pushing because we can never be good enough. We talk about user experience and yep. old IT and at the very tip of things, because I was there too as a platoon leader once upon a time at Fort Stewart, as you noted at the outset. Yep. 
and never forgetting why we're doing this, uh, why we're we're implementing cloud, why we're working on JAD C2, because in my mind's eye, I'm thinking of that 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 day when that high Mars unit is yelling fire and then they've got F-35s rolling over and they're they're in a fight and they've got to succeed. This is truly life or death. And I don't want them saying, damn, the data went down, the, the IT is <laughs> not working. The enemy just cut off our ability to navigate. So we have time right now to get this right. And that's what I want to get after with urgency, accuracy, and uh, and empathy for the force that's out there that has to use all this every day. And that's what I try to do on behalf of President Biden, Secretary Austin, and Secretary Hicks, and the entire force here every single day. Outstanding. For everybody that is going to be listening to this episode of our show across the various podcast networks or watching on our YouTube channel, again, you've been listening to John Sherman, Chief Information Officer, United States Department of Defense. John, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us and educate us on these topics for a little while. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing there at the Pentagon. Thank you for the long service to our country. And as we say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow via what you're doing and a safer tomorrow for all of us. It was really a great time talking to you. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to talk to you as well today. Thank you.